Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to welcome again you here in the uh, Enhancing Game uh, Incubation webinar. It's the second webinar. And uh, I'm glad that you are still very active in participation. And many of you are coming back uh, to get uh, even more experience uh, from our uh, uh, great speakers uh, from all over the uh, region and the world. Uh, for those who don't know uh, what Baltic Sea Game Incubation is, so we are the project uh, uh, which tr tries to connect the uh, local regional ecosystem uh, developers, incubation uh, professionals, mentors, investors uh, with one, one another. And also we want to invite professionals from uh, other parts of the world to share their experience, to uh, share their knowledge with our uh, our community. And uh, in this way, we want to accelerate our uh, industry, our ecosystem out here in the Baltic Sea region. And uh, we want that we our uh, community will be would be more united and we would be more willing to cooperate uh, together toward uh, uh, mutual projects or mutual initiatives in here. And uh, today, today uh, we, we will have a really important topic uh, uh, and um, uh, most uh, of the uh, newcomers in this industry are taking the team building, team formation uh, topic as uh, taking the, this topic uh, for granted uh, and that they have to uh, formate the team to raise it from uh, the team into the community, into organization. It's the, uh, this, it's the same importance as to be, build a uh, working and successful game. And uh, uh, I think that our speaker uh, will cover most of the uh, uh, things, questions related to the team building, team formation, culture, and uh, uh, other very important things. And I'm really happy to uh, present our speaker, a, a Joachim Akhren uh, from Finland, who is the uh, founder of the Elite Game Developers. And uh, he is also uh, a, a, he he, be, he, be, he is also a serious entrepreneur as he began his began his career on 2004 later he joined the supercell uh, analytics teams and he uh, collaborated on the analytics of heyday and uh, clash of clans uh, uh, later he established uh, his own company called next games uh, which went public on nasdaq in finland and uh, later he left that uh, company uh, in 2019 to establish his uh, new venture called Elite Game Developers, where he is uh, releasing post podcasts, books, uh, and uh, uh, all other uh, activities related to supporting young uh, game studios and uh, uh, game co communities. So uh, happy to have you here, uh, Joachim. Could you hear us? And uh, welcome. Hey. Thanks, Totvidas, for that introduction. That was a really good one. <laughs> one of the best in a while. Okay, so before starting, maybe you could let our audience know what uh, are you doing with the Elite Game Developers? What are your roles? And uh, uh, just share some information. Yeah, so Elite Game Developers, which is sort of like an extension of, like, I was thinking that, like, if I start to help entrepreneurs, uh, sort of like being advising mentoring what's the best way to do that okay i could maybe help the companies here in helsinki where i'm based uh, maybe i could have some you know companies here and there that i'm helping but i always thought that you know this online representation of helping is like the internet gives you the possibility to help thousands of people versus like a dozen so that's why I started like creating this content. Like if you go to elitegamedevelopers.com, there's there's a bunch of stuff there that if you're starting a game studio, if you're thinking about that, I think most of the answers are somewhat answered uh, through the content that I put out. And then like 
how, where do you go from there? I have a lot of content for that as well, all those questions. Um, so it's just a really cool way to, to sort of like go and help thousands of entrepreneurs. And that's why, why I really started it. Yeah, so it's uh, really good to hear that we have we are sharing the common mission uh, with you, the uh, Baltic Sea Games and the uh, your organization that are trying to connect the developers and share the knowledge with them, the expertise, which is usually scattered uh, all over the places uh, on this region. And we are just hoping that we can uh, invite more of the experts like you to this uh, these webinars to join us and uh, uh, just invite them to share their, their knowledge and uh, uh, without further ado maybe we can start with with your pre presentation but before that I, I just want to mention that uh, all of the participants uh, you could be very uh, interactive out here in our studio and uh, uh, pop out your questions in the uh, questions section if you have ones for uh, for Joachim and we will uh, try to answer all those questions after the uh, Joachim's uh, talk. And uh, yeah, well, probably that's it from me. And uh, the screen is yours. Great. Thank you. Do you see my Google Sheets presentation? Yeah, I'm sharing it right now on the screen. Awesome. Cool. Everybody, this is like the topic that I wanted to talk to you about. It's like teams and teams buildings in games. I've been doing this for years, so there's a lot there to share, and I'm constantly learning more and more. Where I learn these things is observing companies at similar stages where teams are doing certain things to learn uh, themselves about like how they're, they're approaching things, but I also pick up a lot of things. But yeah, like I'll first do a quick introduction on myself. Uh, there was a short, phase that we already went through introductions but like my background and my mission for for elite game developers is to help game entrepreneurs so that they would thrive in building these games companies so i have the podcast a blog and a book that came out last year on the topic of building video games company called the long-term game so you can pick that up on amazon and then I've also built some online courses around gaming startups, so check those out. So my background in gaming is that I was the co-founder of Next Games. I, if we go back first to 2005 when I started my first gaming company called Iron Star Helsinki, that we were doing like virtual worlds for Nokia phones. It was like the metaverse in 2005. Super early, uh, we did have a lot of users, but we couldn't really make, make a profitable product. Um, so we pivoted to Facebook games, did that for a while until Facebook started closing down all the viral channels and we couldn't do profitable user acquisition and then ended up closing that company in 2011. And then I went to Supercell, who were just starting, like I was probably the 20, 20th employee at Supercell when they were still in, in an office space where uh, it was kind of like 100 square meters of office space only for Supercell. It was like very early days. This Gunshine game was just out. Um, after they they pivoted to, to tablet first and then like focused on the, the new touch-based screen environment for games uh, and Heyday and Clash of Clans came out. I got this itch to, to start another games company and I left in late 2012 uh, from Supercell and then founded Next Games in the spring of 2013 with, with four other people. And then that company did really well. We listed in the stock exchange. We worked on a lot of big IP. Uh, I just wanted to, to change the scenery. I was sort of like burnt out from the whole big explosion that we had through doing the IPO and growing the company to 160 people. Uh, I wanted to take a break, do something else, not build another game studio anytime soon. So I started Elite Game Developers. And well, like today's topic is more about how do you build teams. So I've had a lot of experiences with these companies and 
learned a lot from all of them on team building. But first off, the, the topic I want to cover is this, this founding team, because that's where the company starts, really, when you don't yet have anything besides an idea. Uh, like I was uh, the person who basically built the next game's founding team uh, as an idea that I'm going to do another startup. And then I think our CEO was the first person, uh, CTO, I mean, who, who joined the team. Um, and then, then we got another programmer to join as a co-founder, Jaakko. And then finally, uh, my brother, Mikael, uh, came as the, the fourth co-founder. And later on, Demo, who's the CEO, still nowadays joined as the last person in that founding team. But like thinking about like when you start building this team, you want to ask your, yourself these questions. Why do I need a team and why not start alone? So like I had this big experience with my first startup where I started the whole company alone, uh, which is totally fine if you know what you're doing. But I definitely didn't know what I was doing. Uh, I, I, I sort of like didn't have much of an idea of what kind of hurdles will be happening, how much burden there is actually when you're sort of like everything is relying on you to make the decisions that the company will actually go forward and succeed in a way that you can pay salaries at some point. So with Next Games, the whole idea is, hey, let's, Let's set up a team that knows a lot about game making and that we we have basically people in the founding team who can then then build a game and can sell the game, uh, can market, and can also attract investors with sort of like the understanding that we have that we're a, an attractive team for, for investors. So... Before next games, how did I learn what I needed to know about team team building? So key aspect was actually being involved in the early stages of Supercell for this learning experience for myself to happen. So at Supercell, I was observing the founding team. So they had CEO Ilka Panonen, who's still the CEO, and then the creative director Miko Kodisoya, who's another founding member. So that they had that creative uh, spark there in the team. And then what, which was interesting is that they really loaded up this team of tech people into the founding team, that there were three tech people, but no specific CTO. So this was really clear for, for Supercell is that they didn't want to build this big management layer on top, but rather build these independent teams who operate uh, through kind of like the CEO being the person who then guides the whole company and helps and supports and gives that room for those teams to build things. But the tech people were sort of, they, they knew that since they were building games that would be multiplayer, uh, lots of live uh, content going through as well in these games. Uh, so they had to double down on tech through this founders and they really got I think three of the best uh, game industry technical founders to join and then they did get also an artist into the team but if you if you look at this there were six co-founders in the Supercell co-founding team and I, I think this is this is really cool because they could build a game with the founding team they could build the first prototype and then talk with the investors uh, they could do it on their spare time. Some of them were already out of a job. So it was a kind of like a balance. But I think this is like one of the, the key lessons there for me as well was that can you already start working early on before you raise like money to pay salaries? And the Supercell team could do that, I believe, for like six months before they raised their round. And some of the 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 founders already had some cash to also invest into the company. So if I'd start now, what would I do differently? Well, regarding a founding team, I would definitely sort of look into my skills and my experience in 
making games companies and what is sort of like working for me, uh, what what I know, what I love, what is sort of like an area where I don't feel that I want to be involved. And then like try to find the best people to be complementary for your skills so that it doesn't go into this kind of area where where you're sort of like believing that, okay, you're going to be holding 10 different hats. Uh, and then all of a sudden you notice that you can't really do all of that work. So try to find people who can, who can take care of uh, all the aspects that go into at least making that product. I think that's still the key in a games company is that you get a game uh, being built at as early as possible to show that you can you can do it. So, like I already talked about this, also it's it's some something that comes from your gut. Like, uh, what do I really want to do? Because the role that you're taking as a founder, like I would hope that you're going to be doing that same thing for twenty years. So it's there's no quick exit. So it's I always think that it's better to sort of double down on a long journey ahead. Um, and that's why also the ambition level should be with the team sort of like aligned that everybody feels that uh, they have similar ambitions and also values and beliefs uh, that you value similar kind of ways of working, similar kind of building this uh, good culture uh, since the, the values and these beliefs are where the culture really comes from. It doesn't come from anywhere else. You can, of course, cultivate it and you can learn and you can like dig deep into what you're, what you're doing, what you're thinking. But it is so much from the gut where it comes from. And like, finally, like if I would be doing the, the founding team thing right now, I would search, like I would try to look for like hundreds of people before I pick sort of like the, the, the founding team like i i i think i went for next games i did go through dozens of people but now i i'm more confident that if i would start doing it right now i would spend even more time like i spent probably four months on building the founding team but now i could even think about spending a year and just you know marinating on the, the business idea at the same time on the values and and using that as a base for like attracting the right founders uh, into the team. So there's, there's this concept, which is called the dream team that a lot of venture capital investors talk about. And you can see these this posts of uh, some team that doesn't have a game ready yet, or they don't even have anything to show as a game, but they're still raising t 10 to 20 million uh to develop their game so like that's that's of course happening a lot but what does that mean um so if you have this kind of like big team in your hands like you have people who have built and sold stuff they are sort of like this a class team and they can get instant access to the capital before they even start pitching and they can raise these big million dollar uh, rounds. Well, they, they usually do have a prototype, but they're not really like, it's not you know anywhere close to being live. Uh, but this is like really the primary reasons why certain startups get funded. First off, the team is so believable that they can at least do something. You know, if the first game doesn't work, okay, they're gonna, they can, pull off another project quite quickly, maybe something that is less risky, but not as ambitious, but they're still going to be building a company that is very attractive for acquirers. This is where the, the investor appetite really comes from. But let's say that you can't build the dream team. I've actually written an article about this, this sort of like the B team. Uh, it, it, it's sort of, in that realm where it's it's totally fine that you don't have these A-class players, but you're still gonna need to prove yourself in other ways. So like one way is to, to start digging through all the content that I'm putting out and learning that sort of those fundamentals uh, and not sort of like I, I wrote in this B-team article that the C-team would be somebody who's 
who is sort of like in the desert, you know, wandering in a circle uh, and not really escaping that circle. So you need to escape that circle by learning what you're doing wrong, uh, where you, do you need to change things that you're doing. So then uh, talking about structuring the team, uh, like let's first focus on the, the founding team. So think about the skills, uh, where do you need? Uh, you want to have people who are, who are sort of like these learning machines that they're, they have a big appetite to learn things. It's not like we're just you know here and now we're gonna be making these games and we're as good as we'll ever get. They need to be studying what's going on in the market, what are other people doing. If you have two companies, why did the other one work? Why did the other one fail? And then you have to have somebody who wants and really truly is the CEO who drives the vision of the company. And you have uh, this product data creative person there as well who can sort of like hold all of these hats at the same time. I know this is difficult. I'm going to be expanding on this soon. And then you have to have those tech co-founders. Uh, but first, let's talk about this product data creative person. It's like... You know, th thinking about like a question that an investor might have. So you guys don't have a free-to-play expert. Like if you're thinking about going into mobile, if you are going into that realm where it's going to be metrics that you're looking at, uh, oftentimes when I'm looking at the pitch from from teams, I'm I'm seeing that a lot of companies are, you know, lacking these these skills in their team the knowledge of free to play, like from working on free to play games. So that is of course like unfortunate and that's very common, but can you actually do something about that? I think you can uh, by, by just, you know, uh, delving into like what's going on in the market and really spending time on learning the market. Like, like I already talked about this, uh, you know, not having the feeling that you, you're sort of like, fixed and you won't learn more and now we just need to do these games so there's this term called fixed mindset and, and growth mindset so the fixed mindset is more about like saying we know everything we need to know about making games but uh it's also like this this statement that i have a certain amount of intelligence uh, and i'm gonna apply it now so the, i think the question goes to is like, do you understand why certain games are doing well? What are the underlying reasons for those games to work? And then you, th these people might be saying that, ah, oh, yeah, hyper casual games, those aren't real games. Like that's, I, I think, also part of the fixed mindset uh, of, you know, bashing ideas that are innovative. I would say hyper casual games are really innovative and, and there's a lot of innovation happening there. So the growth mindset is a person who wants to learn and they want to know what they can do better if they know more. <laughs> that is the thing. And they believe in this statement that they can do a lot more better things by knowing more things. I, and they're also not sort of like going into, hey, I don't have time to learn. Like, okay, do you have time to watch Netflix? Do you have time to watch YouTube? Like, spend at least 50% of that sort of like leisure time into actually like learning about what other people are doing. Play those games that you hate playing, but still spend the time to understand what's going on there in those markets because you're going to be picking up so many things and have those discussions in the team as well about like what you're learning. So the growth mindset agrees with this statement that learning can significantly enhance my intelligence and i would say like in my career in gaming this concept hasn't really come up that much and i'm like very pissed off that i just realized it in this decade of like i i should have been very much more like pushing for this this sort of like activity in my previous startups so yeah i i hope a lot of people can pick up sort of the growth mindset uh, mentality. So hiring the staff, if you're uh, getting people past the founding team, I think 
the same things really need to apply. You want to hire for a similar culture. So later comers should be compensated maybe in a different way, but you still want to have a, 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 a sort of like a fit to what kind of culture you're building. So I'm going to expand on this a bit. First off, I think you want to hire by checking for the right personality traits. Like I, I always think that nice people are the ones that you want to have around. Also honest people, like these people with a lot of integrity uh, that then when things get tough, that they don't bail out, they're going to stay with you. They're going to figure out those bad problems. They feel responsible for things. They, they can hold themselves accountable and other people accountable. Uh, and I, I think this statement of you don't have to be a leader to be a leader is also what you want to look for in these traits of people. Um, sort of like that it doesn't need to be a title. It doesn't need to be a you know pay increase because you're going to be doing tough things. Uh, and then uh, when you are doing a game studio, a small studio, hiring a team, you want to look for people who are willing to start off with a pay cut from that big company if they're joining. Because uh, I, I believe it's, it is sort of like a, a position that you go back and you take on challenges and you also need to be realistic about like if you and everybody else in the startup is sort of like taking a big salary, uh, maybe you should postpone that for 12 months and then go after the bigger salary. Uh, and yeah, you want to see that they work well with your existing team. So there's a lot of ways you can do this. You can do some projects, like a mini project that takes maybe two weeks or like that in the evenings you do stuff together. Or it doesn't need to be two weeks. It could be like even a weekend uh, of a project where you jam on a game idea or something like that to see how, how well they fit with you. So here's a few statements about hiring for a culture. So this is Patrick Collison, the, the co-founder and CEO of Stripe, which is this payment startup. Uh, before you make an offer to somebody, think about whether uh, you'd like to have 10 times as many people like them in your company. And the second one from Petri Koponen, who used to be the chairman of Supercell, he said that when thinking about where, whether you should hire somebody, someone or not, Try to imagine the average quality of the people at your company. Then ask yourself whether the new hire would increase that average or not. So only hire if the average will increase. Like this, this should go for every role in the company. Everybody's pushing forward to, to, to reach the company mission. Uh, you're not going to be like, why would you hire people who don't sort of like push the envelope further. And like this, then the second rule sort of like helps really a lot to achieve what Peter is saying there. So you want to hire slowly, but fire fast. If you notice that your, your sort of uh, expectation or understanding that the person would actually raise the bar went wrong, or maybe they weren't, they don't have high integrity, like fire them fast. Like get like try to build mechanisms where you don't let the wrong people stay in the company. Like there's these brilliant jerks which seem like the really the best coder in the world, but then they're really toxic. You start noticing them banging on the guitar, uh, on the keyboards, or or you know swearing like crazy, and everybody feels sort of like bad around them. Don't keep those people in the company. Like it's better to have a hole in your organization than an a hole. This is like a like a, a statement that I picked up somewhere along the way. So we tend to overestimate the negative impact of letting go of someone and ignore the damage done by leaving things as they are. So of course, like letting go, somebody might shake up the team for a moment, but like a few weeks later, your company will definitely be in a better place. I've I've seen sort of like this, both these situations where the brilliant jerk wasn't fired, 
and where they were fired quickly. And uh, I would definitely suggest always firing as quickly as possible. Then the team, team sort of like building aspects, like you want to start off building a leadership team. Uh, if you think about like your founding team, you want to maybe expand on who the founders were. Like in gaming, you, you could getting this uh, chief product officer and chief technology officer or like Supercell pretty interesting because they actually don't have anybody else at the, the sort of like the, the leadership level besides the, the CEO Ilka and the COO, CFO, Janne Snellman. And then they have the game leads who run the game projects. And that is basically their layers. Uh, Ilka talks about this, uh, the least powerful CEO. Uh, and I, I, I'm a big fan of that model. And the, the more and more I'm studying and spending time looking at gaming companies, I, I believe this is the, the model, uh, sort of like the foundation for anyone thinking about like, how do you build games? Is that you... This allows magic to happen. And like the more you sort of layer this kind of like big management who are creating projects, who are creating initiatives, and then people are building those initiatives. I, I think the ownership and the empowerment just isn't there for magical creation. And people will keep their cool ideas for themselves and use them later on. I've, I've seen this. This happen a lot, and I, I think the the supercell model is the the way to go. Then some tools for 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 sort of like building this uh, great culture and building the team. So all hands meetings, you want to communicate and have a constant dialogue. Uh, you're talking about the values and beliefs, uh, so that people remember why you are there. Uh, especially the purpose of the company, like asking questions, why does the games world need our company? Why do the players need this company? And then a mission, uh, a mission could last for years uh, that you're trying to sort of like go uh, and be, let's say, hey, wanna, we want to be the best game studio for game developers in the Baltics. Like that's a mission that, is very sort of and the games are sort of like the side effect of that you know so you want to build missions that really build your systems <laughs> I, i'm a big fan of systems and not goals so like a, a mission that focuses on the system and not the goal i think is the best way to go and you want to ask your employees uh what do you suspect the reasons will be when we fail sort of like this pre postmortem like that you're already understanding what are the things that will go wrong and might uh, are most likely wants to go wrong uh so it's also a good idea when you're having a one-on-one -on -one discussion that you're sort of like unearthing these major issues that are going on because these are usually the things that people are asking when when an employee leaves the company, but like you could ask those already like as early as possible and just keep talk, talking about this kind of like paranoia of how, how are we gonna fail so that you avoid those situations. So then I already touched base a bit on one-on-ones. So Mathilde Collin, who is a uh, founder of Front, which is this kind of email uh, application, uh, she writes a lot about uh, her, her leadership and she has different, uh, different one-on-one -on -one discussions that, that she does. So if done effectively, one-on-ones are an opportunity to show my team that I care about them, their success and happiness. And it gives them an opportunity to step back and think about what they need to be successful and to hold me accountable for setting them up for this success. So you want to set up a situation where if you're the leader of the team, that you are this kind of teacher leader approach where you're bringing them information and sort of like stimulating their curiosity. Uh, I think this goes back again to the growth mindset building. And then you have values and beliefs and a purpose and mission. So often something that games companies start 
uh, worrying about when they hit like 20 people or like 50 people. They like small studios don't really think about the mission enough. But I, I think people are much better off if they start a lot more early. So why should small companies really mad like think about the mission and the purpose and the values? Well, an individual will have a reason to get out of bed in the morning. <laughs> like what is the the reason for them to come to, to work? So usually the main reason for failure for startups is that the founders give up. Like they either see that it's just too exhausting. I'm going to you know, do something else now. I, I think for my first startup, this was like one of the big reasons why it failed was that I just couldn't keep the team anymore. I didn't want to be a one man company uh, without any salary because I couldn't pay any more salary to anybody and no investor wanted to fund us. So I was giving up. I could have spent like, let's say, six months coming up with an idea that this is what we're going to do. We're going to start the company again. We're going to, you know, recapitalize the cap table where the investors will be diluted to close to zero. And we start again. Let's start off the company again, boot it up. But I was just too tired. But I, I think it's not a bit about being tired, but it's more about being motivated by a purpose and a mission. So... If you're not seeing progress or game failing to become a commercial success, it's you're sort of like being motivated by these short-term incentives. But you want to build a company that's going to be there for, you know, after you die. <laughs> like try to focus on those kind of situations. I, I think there's that's the only way to, to motivate people to get out of bed in the morning. So if you have a just cause or something, like bigger than you ever believe happening. I think that's going to push you to continue. Then thinking about the vision, determine why the company exists. Uh, like talk about this, where are we going to be in 20 years? Try to des describe that and then work backwards from how do you get there? Like there's this, great framework by Tim Collins, who's this author of this Built to Last, Good to Great, Great by Choice, and How the Mighty Might Fail. He has this uh, framework in his latest book, this Beyond Entrepreneurship 2.0, where he sort of like puts vision to contain the core beliefs and values, and then purpose and mission. And he really lays these out really nicely. I, I think if there's any book that you want to read about building great game games companies, this is not specifically for a games company, but it is for apply, applicable directly. So you can go to Amazon and look up Beyond Entrepreneurship 2.0. I think the cover has like BE 2.0 in it. So one, one other tool is the Brain Trust from Pixar. I, how do you get a director to address a problem he or she can't see? So the brain trust will point out these issues. Like, you know, they have a film under review, but it's not the filmmaker, the director, who's going to be, you know, being getting pointed out what's going on. So they, people are more like free to, to share ideas and opinions and criticism. So the brain trust meets every few months to assess each movie we're making. The premise is simple, put smart, passionate people in a room together, charge them with identifying and solving problems, and encourage them to be candid. So the brain trust has no authority. The director does not have to follow, follow any specific suggestions. After the meeting, it's up to them to figure out how they address the feedback. So why is this brain trust so useful? I think for a game team, it could be, like, how do you get a game lead to address a problem he or she can't see? And as a company grows, the schedules usually start driving the, the output. So the strength of the idea is not up there anymore. It's more about, like, how do we get this game out? Uh, so the brain trust sort of, like, brings you back to, to, like, cracking the idea. And if you have that kind of system in place, it's it's hard to sort of, like, focus on not putting the brain trust time into your schedules. So it's it's a very good environment where as a group, 
you sort of like feel that you finally can talk openly about issues without seeming like you're being a douchebag or something. So Kat Moll, who is the, the author of this book called Creativity Inc., and he's also the founder of Pixar, uh, you are not your idea. And if you identify too closely with your ideas, you will take offense when challenged. So I'm going to skip a bit. Um, how do you apply this to gaming? Uh, to start your own brain trust, Catmull recommends choosing people that make you think smarter, putting lots of solutions on the table and finding people who will level with you. And the brain trust is made up of people with a deep understanding of storytelling who usually have been through the process themselves. So start with the game designers and product people and then carefully expand from there. So Pixar's brain trust was first like a well-defined group, but then they started expanding it out from directors to, to writers to, to head of story. Everybody who sort of like has a knack for storytelling. So why can it be hard to uphold the brain trust? Think, while I attend and participate in almost all brain trust meetings, I see my primary role as making sure that the compact upon which the meetings are based is protected and upheld. This would be the CEO who would own the brain trust. And if, if you stop doing brain trusts, it's sort of like the CEO's problem. So it goes really like to the person who is at the top. And you can't totally eliminate all the blocks of candor, but there's going to be fear about saying something stupid, but you want to address those as well and sort of like point out that this is what, what could be done differently. So another tool that you can, you can use to build teams is to have a crunch policy. Like, you know, crunch is like working... Uh, long days for long many months uh, every weekend you're in the office making that game to work that's very common in console and pc uh, ages and it's it's not that uncommon in mobile either but yeah a lot of teams start off by saying that we're not going to crunch and okay then we always still crunch like how do you get rid of it uh, don't do any big uh, bang game launches so think about mobile game making more as this kind of ua driven where you silently sort of like launch the game and start scaling it slowly on the app store without waiting for like hey we're gonna have this big featuring day because then you're gonna be you know rushing for that date always so you want to still keep some sense of urgency there uh, but I, I believe that the crunch is where all of this burnout and people leaving the company uh, and eventually leaving also the industry is happening. I've heard so many people leave because they were just too burned out because of crunching on games. Then the financial incentives as tools. So salary and stock options are, are really key here. But like having big financial incentives can be detrimental because it changes changes the, the motivation from this uh, long term to, to more like a short term, like gains. Like, uh, I, I think a stronger vision and like, you know, having a reason to exist is bigger motivation for all kinds of situations. But you want to be as transparent as possible, share information on people, how you're distributing salaries, stock options, uh, talk about that early on as possible. And if somebody's coming from that bigger studio, try to pay uh, them in a, in a modest fashion, whatever you're sort of like comfortable with, but try to at least level it so that everybody else is also getting a similar kind of compensation. And then one of the final tools I'm going to mention is the safe environment. So vulnerability means that you're creating an environment where everybody feels safe to raise their hand and say, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, the leaders should show their example. They, they should talk about like ways that they've, they've sort of uh, felt also vulnerable. Uh, there's an example actually that was recently uh, put out by Sophie Wu, who's the game lead and studio head at uh, Voodoo Berlin about what she did wrong in the first year of running the studio, which is really great read. It's on Medium. 
Uh, so she talks about uh, all these things that went wrong, and it's her showing really well the, the vulnerability and creating this safe environment through that so that everybody else can also talk freely and free, feel safe at the studio. So just to summarize these tools, the all hands, you got to do one-on-ones with people, figure out your vision, mission, and the core values, and use the brain trust model. Don't do crunch if you don't really want to, but like try to uphold the right policy. Figure out your financial incentives in a way that it's fair and transparent. And finally, the, the safe environment. Thanks, guys. Uh, go check out EliteGameDevelopers.com and subscribe to the newsletter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joachim. Brilliant. Uh, it was a really informative uh, presentation. A lot of um, uh, stuff out there to grasp. Uh, I hope that uh, everyone managed to write down the best ideas, uh, the, the, the best sentences. And uh, if you didn't, uh, we got you covered because after the uh, this event, you will uh, you will get an email with the record, recording uh, link. Uh, this link will work for a few uh, few weeks and afterwards uh, uh, for a temp temporary you will you will be able to re-watch our webinars on uh, the Lithuania Innovation Center YouTube channel so uh, the previous webinar is also available there so if uh, Joachim is not against that we will share this uh, a webinar with our audience uh, on, on, on our uh, YouTube channel. So we will put it there. So uh, uh, all of uh, those who registered or didn't and didn't manage uh, uh, and didn't manage to come here to watch this webinar will be able to watch it and uh, use these ideas uh, to their project. That would be great. Yeah. And uh, while we are waiting uh, while we are waiting for the questions uh, from our uh, audience uh, maybe I, I will uh, just give it give some uh, of my questions to you so uh, usually you know the uh, game starting game companies uh, are started like uh, hobbies uh, of friends comp uh, friend uh, companies you know uh, where uh, game developers, game designers just gathering together doing game janks or something to create something funny and they, they're thinking that they can uh, develop the project into something bigger and they're just uh, starting to create some kind of a company like a co-founders. Co but, uh, you know, the uh, roles within the team is uh, quite, you know, the same. Most of them are either good programmers or good designers but uh, usually they are lacking of marketing team, uh, executive, and etc. So, first of all, whether it's possible to make uh, from that maybe the uh, great programmer, the great uh, executive, or from the great designer, uh, the great uh, market ma marketing uh, uh, leader, or uh, it is more advisable to get an external person uh, from very start or there is some kind of point where the company should start looking for external expertise or uh, hire new, new new people yeah it really depends on what kind of product you're making i can answer from the the mobile game perspective uh, when you when you launch the game and you see that you can make money with it i think that's the point where you want to look for external help with running these campaigns. I think otherwise it's it's quite tough to, to you know justify the costs. Like if you're just running tests on the app store, seeing like if people like it, if if it's like making enough money, if the metrics are good enough, and you you can you can really learn that by just looking at a lot of online material and. You know why not the the ceo could take over the marketing for that moment or an artist or somebody who's making the ad creatives could also run the campaign so it's it's not rocket science uh but when you get to that stage where you start thinking okay now we're going to be spending you know every day 
thousand euros on marketing and next month we might want to go to two thousand euros five thousand euros a day then you want to start having the so, sort of like external really good help there okay thank you and we have uh, the first question from our uh, audience uh Gideminas is asking uh, the strategy to hire with pay cut apply for continuing hiring after the founders when uh, new team members are not present with stake uh, option can you repeat i didn't uh, hear the, uh, the strategy to hire with pay cuts apply for continuing hiring after the founders uh, uh, were present uh, so do, do you continue to to, to uh, apply that uh, pay cut uh, strategy uh, after the final founders are in place or you yeah, or you are uh, choosing the stake uh, stake option yeah you, you like one there's totally it it so much depends on so many situations but one big reason why you need to do it is that you just don't have the funding like let's say if you even have like let's say 200,000 in your bank account uh do you want to la that for to last for um a year that's always something I, I would want to do is like if you raise money from investors that it lasts at least one year so when you're at that stage that you are making some money that you're paying the team and you can see that in in three months or a few months we're going to be making even more money like it's a gradual growth then you can start putting the the salaries more into sort of like in line with the market numbers so I wouldn't immediately stop pay cut, like, like, you know, paying smaller salaries uh, when the founders are in place. I would still try to find people who are willing to join with a smaller salary and who could take, you know, stock options or something like that. Sort of like as a, you know, you're taking risk here, but if we do really well, you're going to be an owner in the company in the future and we're going to grow this into, into something really unbelievable. Okay, I think uh, I hope uh, we answered Gideminas' question, and we are, are seeing more and more questions popping up in in the section. So the other qu questions is from Christine. Uh, what do you think of the idea of having a nucleus, the founding team, and get uh, them in different teams, one specific team per game? Hmm. Interesting question. I think like. If you, if you, it really depends again, like I'll give you an example. Like if you have one game that is sort of like, hey, it might start making money now, uh, or it, you can start growing it, but you still need to do updates. You need to put in more content, more features. Uh, I, I don't think you want to spread yourself too thin, but it really depends on like how good your founding team is that you can sort of spread out into teams. I wouldn't like at the early stage I would never do more than two games at once uh, of course depends like if you're a hyper casual studio you might need to be doing several projects because uh, you're going to be anyways killing projects every week um, but yeah like be cautious about spreading yourself too thin that's what I would say Thank you, Joachim. And uh, we are heading to a question that were written by Alan. And there's a, a lot of questions written down by him. So I'll, I'll start by first question from him is, how do you convince the first two, four people to join your team? Um, good question. Uh, you want to be an attractive sort of place to work and do something that has purpose. Like, I think so few companies are thinking about this. Why do we exist in the, why does the game industry need our company? Why, why do people who love games, why do they need us? Like if you can figure out something that is really coming like seriously and from your heart and you can talk about that like genuinely, I think that's a big sell uh, as, a, as a differentiator for people 
Like if, if you're just selling, you know, we're going to do hyper casual games or we're going to do, you know, this next match three game. Like this is the game idea. Do you want to join? That that sounds pretty boring. Like, uh, like try to find something that you can differentiate with. I think that's the the main main thing there. And uh, also, there was a, a question from uh, Alan. Do you, can you convince those uh, newcomers into the team by, by the game idea, business model, or, or does these motivators work? Or you yeah. should. No, not really. <laughs> no, of, often it's like I would say you're gonna be competing with everybody else who has a game game <laughs> like idea. Uh, either it's something that okay, the game works already. You can convince them with that, or you can go with the the purpose that I was just talking about. That you really like find a vision for the company and be really genuine about that. Okay, so uh, I hope that the, the, the vast majority of Alan's questions were answered. Then I want to move to Eric's question. What, uh, what are the best sources for game companies from a fundraising uh, perspective? I think angel investors are really good. Uh, it depends on the platform. If, if you're doing PC and console, uh, you probably want to talk with publishers, and that's never easy. Uh, the reason why angel investors and, and VCs, venture capital investors, are really good for all sorts of uh, service-based games is that they have the model of uh, this uh, customer acquisition cost is lower than the play player lifetime value, where if you spend $1 to get a user and that user spends two dollars in the game in their whole total lifetime of playing that game uh, you're going to get one dollar as, as profit um, so that is why so many people are doing investments into those service-based games versus the premium games because the 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 user acquisition model works so well for for the the venture capital world so it, it's just more like a supply and demand thing. But like depending on your case, if you're doing premium games, you would need to talk with the publisher. If you're doing uh, a live service-based game like free-to-play, uh, mobile, MMO, whatever, then then you would go with the, the VC and angels. Okay, and uh, there's a new question from uh, Yeva. Uh, any tips for increasing ownership within teams that keeps shifting on project by project basis? Hmm. I'm thinking like what is going on there? <laughs> like if it's um, like if you're asking more about this kind of uh, independent teams, like like that it's fundamentally something that you want to sort of has have as principles like how do you make games like it's hard like if you're already you know committed let's say you're making this game uh and you need to get it out as soon as possible uh because there's stakeholders like there's a publisher waiting for the game um like what you want to do is definitely keep the people there who you who came up with the idea, who have the vision for the game. And if you're sort of like shifting people around, bringing new people in the team, I'd rather give them a lot of space to actually like pivot the game a bit into a new direction where they believe it should be going. So, yeah, like try to give more power to the people, like whatever your sort of circumstances are. Like if if you need to piss off a publisher, just do it. Um, it. It makes total sense, and and just you know give people the chance to to build the game that it should be. Uh, so uh, and uh, also I want to raise a question about the uh, the whole culture of the company and how uh, it is changing when you are working with the uh, investors, for example, as you you said that. Uh, uh, it is very important to have that healthy uh, 
uh, well-formed uh, culture in the team when everything is trusting each other and they are, have a motivation, same vision, mission to build everything. But uh, uh, how it could be should be leveraged uh, with the accountability and that grinding for to to achieve certain uh, tasks, uh, certain goals of the team, you know, which usually comes uh, uh, from the investors, where 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 uh, the some kind of deadlines uh, arrives with the uh, in investor. So how to leverage that accountability uh, to the investors and to maybe to the leader of the team uh, and how leader should uh, establish that good relations with their employees, but also um, ask for maybe the to 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 make everything uh, before the deadline to, to uh, achieve certain uh, goals and uh, do not trespass that border of being uh, dishonest or, or, or uh, harsh for its own uh, employees or, or co-owners. Yeah, I, like let's distinguish, distinguish bad and good investor <laughs> like or, you know, somebody who, who really knows what they're doing. So bad investors putting money in and being sort of like not involved or not understanding the business, not understanding the fundamentals of how hard it is to make games, and then calling in every two weeks, what's going on? Where's the game? Like I've seen those kind of investors, but then you have a great, like a great game investor who knows how hard it is to make games, uh, who who believes in head. Like I've looked at all the models and this Supercell's uh, independent team model is the perfect model. Of it's, it's hard to make games, but it is the closest to the most efficient model. So like you have these investors who know gaming and you always want to talk with them and not the, the people who, who are sort of like don't understand gaming at all. I think that's, that's the main difference. So I have had experience with investors who would you know, become agitated and and don't like what's going on if the game is sort of like when it comes out, the numbers are really bad and uh, they don't understand the, the fundamentals where they're putting money into. And I think that's where the problem is and not in the teams. So the teams, what they can do is not raise funding from those people. I think that's that's the main idea. If you don't, If you have options, I think it's better to not have options and like stick with it bootstrapped find cash otherwise okay brilliant answer and uh, you are uh, getting a compliment from our audience uh, <laughs> uh, in the chat <laughs> that you're looking really attractive beyond that uh, you're you gave really good presentation and uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, we are still receiving questions and i think we can uh, uh, finish with the, this webinar with this question. It's uh, about the uh, the other industries that, that could be involved in the, the game industry. And uh, uh, for the business side of things, would it, uh, would it make sense to be looking for someone outside the game industry, for example, from movie industry or from other cu cultural perspectives? Yeah, I think movies are are actually the closest. It's even like, of course, like there's a lot of people who invest who are in tech, like doing all sorts of uh, technology startups because there's the metric side is pretty similar. Uh, when you're running a live service game or when you're running a live service online technology, something, something. So... Uh, and with the movies that the cool thing there is that it's always project based and you you sort of have uh, a script that is being executed into a movie you also have in gaming you have an idea that is being put into a concept into prototypes in into gaming so there's there is some complementary things there but i would always try to focus on finding people who are who are knowledgeable on operating in games who have experience from doing gaming because there's more and more people who have 
either they're angel investors, they're putting their own money in, in into startups in gaming, they've done money already in gaming. Like there's so many stock stock exchange listed companies in gaming now. Like I, I believe there was like more companies in the last 12 months went public than in the last 10 years, like the previous 10 years. So there's a lot of people with cash and knowledge about games. So like what I usually advise people when they're sort of like saying that, oh, we don't like who are angel investors in gaming? Well, you can create your own angel investors. Just go to LinkedIn, look at big gaming companies and find their you know, founders on LinkedIn and ask, hey, we're, we're raising funding. Are you doing any angel investing? I could send you our pitch deck. I think that is being done in San Francisco in like the Bay Area tech scene a lot where people are basically putting the money back. So it's it's not the worst cold call or cold message you can send out. Brilliant advice. And uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you are also investing in games, yes? Yeah. So, yeah, so... I have, uh talk about that too much but like i'm a venture partner at uh, play ventures and i'm also an angel investor in in mostly like free to play uh, mobile studios so maybe uh, you can let people know where they can follow you or where how they can connect with you in order to maybe connect with you and uh, share their uh, projects with you yeah linkedin is really good I'm I'm definitely going to accept any anybody in the game industry as LinkedIn connections so that's the best place and of course like you know check out elite game developers I think that's a good place to start for like learning more about like where I'm investing brilliant so I really advise everyone to follow uh, Joachim on LinkedIn I have already done that and I'm getting uh, a good a good feed out there and also I'm checking uh, elite game developers from time to time so thank you from for all your insights that you uh brought us brought to us here also what you're doing for the whole community uh, i hope uh, uh, we, we would be managed to invite you to our further events to maybe meet you personally physically on, on some events in, maybe here in lithuania or in other baltic sea region countries we would be really really glad, glad to have you uh, with us in uh, our further activities yeah thanks thought with us this was really fun i'm definitely gonna come back <laughs> <laughs> thanks thanks and for all our listeners we uh, are going to continue with uh, our webinar series uh, if you are not going to the uh, holiday season on uh, july so probably we will uh, re release a new uh, webinar for you on a very other other very interesting topic so see you on other occasions and other webinars it was a pleasure to have you here Joachim, and have a good day everyone thanks you too see you everybody bye bye